Yes. Um, thank you to Andy and Tammy for inviting Penny and I up and uh, for providing an excellent bed and breakfast service uh, last night of the day. So we're well fed and watered. And uh, thank you to all of you for coming out to be here today. Um, one thing always really gladdens my own heart is to see men and women of God who really want to learn more about the Word of God and how to help God's church be healthy and strong and, and grow and mature. And that's something that's so important we must not lose as a fellowship, whether here in Birmingham or across all of our churches. So uh, that's wonderful. We're going to talk about eldership today. Um, I will share a little bit more about Penny and, my, and I, about our connection with Birmingham and the Midlands area in the introduction to my sermon later. So mm -hmm. you can come back for that uh, if you like. <laughs> so that'll be a little bit later on. Um, but we do have strong connections uh, here from mostly... <clears throat> Uh, 30 years ago. Okay. Uh, you know, which, because most of you here were not even born then. Uh, right? right? So, just pointing out a few things. Um, but I would like to say this, in, in terms of our own connection, uh, we were here uh, as part of the mission team that planted the Birmingham Church in 1988. And it was a joy to be here. It was an amazing thing to be at the first official service uh, at a hotel somewhere near the cathedral. I forget the name of the Grand hotel. hotel. It was in the Grand. It was in the Grand. The Grand. Was it quite, the Grand. Near, the quite near the cathedral area somewhere? The Grand. The Grand. Okay. On the opposite side of the road. Is it opposite side of the road? Thank you. It was Easter Sunday. I remember, uh, 1988, and uh, Penny and I were there. And it was a, a dream come true to be there, to see that. And now here we are, all these years later, and I believe it is time to talk about eldership. Surely it is time now, at least, all these years later, to talk about eldership. I think it's appropriate. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. I believe that in a sense, Birmingham has a connection with what Paul said to Titus in Titus chapter 1 verse 5, the reason I left you in Crete was that you might put in order what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. It tells us several things. It tells us that Titus knew he had a responsibility to uh, appoint elders. It tells us that Paul already uh, let him know of that responsibility and presumably trained him to be adequate to the task of appointing elders. It tells us that both Paul and Timothy, uh, Titus must have understood that elders were a very significant part of the future health of the church and churches in Crete and the different towns. It tells us that they needed elders in every town. It tells us presumably by this stage in Crete, they had churches in many towns in Crete. It wasn't just one or two places in one city. It was, they were in different places. It also tells us that in Paul's mind, presumably understood in Titus's mind, that a church without elders is a church with unfinished business. And so I think it would be reasonable to say that a church of Birmingham's maturity still has some unfinished business. Mm -hmm. Maybe it has more unfinished business than simply the unfinished that business of eldership. Mm -hmm. well, I'm not limiting it to that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not also saying, as we'll talk about later, that we should be so focused on eldership that we don't celebrate the other things that God is doing that are good. It's not the be-all and end-all, but it is still ultimately a fact that there is unfinished business. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Somebody asked me about deacons. I just want to mention, I think those are very, that's a very important topic. But I, A, was not asked to speak about deacons. And B, frankly, we do not have the time to get that into the time we have now. So that will have to be uh, Another my visit. next visit. Oh, yeah, come on. <laughs> if this one goes okay. Mm. We'll see how we do, right? Mm. So... We're going to talk about three things today. We're going to talk about what an elder is. Then later we'll talk about what an elder does. And finally, we will talk about an elder's vision. 
what I see in the scriptures as being, in a sense, the vision that an elder might have. Along the way, I'm open to answering questions if we don't cover things that you're particularly interested in or think are important. What I'd ask you to do is come and speak to me in the breaks with questions, and then I can tell you whether we're going to cover it in the next section, or I can add it in if possible, or I may have to say we haven't got time. But we'll see. But questions, please, uh, in the breaks. So first of all, what is an elder? How would you recognize one if you saw one? Wrinkly. <laughs> right. You wear a suit. Now, some scriptures today we're going to read in the Bible. Some will be on screen, and some I'm going to refer to. And I'm going to trust you to write those down and look at them later if we don't have time to go through them in detail today. But the first thing about eldership I'd like to say is I think that God has always wanted his people to be well shepherded. Amen. And we see that from the Old Testament right the way through to the New. Exodus 18, you may be familiar with the situation. We have Moses and the people of Israel. How is Moses feeling? Overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Some of you are leaders. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? Even if you're not supposedly with a title of a leader, many of you have uh, other responsibilities in life. Perhaps you have children. Everybody who manages people gets overwhelmed. It's a fact. Moses, great man as he was, the most humble person that lived, that lived on the face of the earth, even he got a little overwhelmed. His father-in-law is provided by God to see, help him see reason. And he goes and says, what you're doing is not good because you're exhausted trying to do all this work. And in verse 17, 18, we'll pick it up there. You and these people who come to you will only wear them yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me, and I will give you some advice. And may God be with you. Verse 19. Yeah. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to Him. Teach them His decrees. And uh, teach them His de 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 instructions. Show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. Verse 21. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. Appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties and tens and have them serve as judges. What do we see here? We see that there is a need for a wise shepherding of God's people. God wants men to be there who are capable, we might say wise, the, I think capable, competent, strong enough. They're wise people. Uh, they fear God. I think the implication is they fear God more than man, right? Uh, they are trustworthy. They hate dishonest gain. So they're not only trustworthy, but they hate evil. They love what is good. They hate what is wrong, what is evil, and appoint them. They need to be known to be appointed. They need to know they have a responsibility. The people need to know that these people have a responsibility and appoint them as officials over and certain numbers of people. We, I'm not going to deal with all the details in this passage, but I just want to say I think God always has had a plan for his people to be well looked after. That's his heart. The reference in Deuteronomy 1 verse 9 is to the when God says, I carried you. When he talks to his people in Israel, I carried you through the desert. It, he, he has that shepherd's heart. When we think about someone being carried, I always think of that parable in Luke 15 about the shepherd who goes to look for the lost sheep. We'll talk about that later. And carries that lost sheep. And that's the image I think we have here of God. He is that shepherd himself, which is why he wants to have his people shepherd, and why he finds shepherd there, and that's why he finds ways to help them to be shepherd as well. Um, Moving on from there, we might think about David. Uh, David is described as someone who was a good shepherd. In Psalm 78, let me just turn to this one. Psalm 78, picking it up in verse 70, one of the longer psalms. 
God, it says, he chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens, from tending the sheep he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart, with skillful hands, he led them. Isn't that a wonderful description of the heart of David? And he took him, God took him from the sheep pen to put him over God's people. Now we know that David was flawed, but we also know that he began with a great heart. And that heart is shown in the way that he shepherded his people. And David himself refers to uh, these qualities within himself in, in 1 Samuel 17. We will turn to that one as well. Let's just go there. Get this feel for the shepherding heart of God and who he wants to shepherd his people. 1 Samuel 17 and verse, uh, let's pick it up in verse 34. So David is with King Saul. He's saying to King Saul, my brothers are afraid of Goliath. The whole army of Israel is afraid of Goliath. I am not afraid of Goliath. Send me. And Saul is not confident about this, but David says, in verse 34, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. But basically, if I can do that to a bear or a lion, I can... I, Goliath... Well, who cares about Goliath? I mean, he, it'll be easy. Mm -hmm. uh, after all that, and Saul is persuaded, and of course, David does do this. I think it shows again the heart of David. I mean, it's a sheep. It's a sheep. Mm. No, I mean, honestly, I mean, let it, let it die. I, it's a sheep. I mean, that's a bear, and that, that's a lion. I mean, that's, these are dangerous animals. I mean, if one came in here right now, I... If it was one of us, maybe, if it, you know, if it went after my wife, I'd be concerned. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, would, I would ring the police. I would. I would do that for her. But if it was a sheep, I'm out of here, right? I, there's, there's something about this. There's something about the care. There's something about the courage. And if, if I can get something across today about eldership, I would like to get that across. And I think so much of what it means to be an elder. What is an elder? It's someone with uncommon, an uncommonly caring heart, moved to compassion, to help. And it's someone with an uncommonly courageous heart, who's willing to go to the fight for God's people. And I think we see this in David. I know we haven't got to the New Testament passages yet, but I think it's important we see the thread through Scripture of the kind of people God uses. And that doesn't change, Old Covenant, New Covenant kind of heart is is the same. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are uh, looking at here. Now let's have a little word about first century culture. Let's now fast forward a good little while to the first century. And I think it's important to have a few words about contemporary culture at the time the New Testament was written to help us understand Paul's instructions about eldership to Timothy and Titus, which we'll come on to. Uh, in Jewish culture, and in fact even Gentile culture at the time, Roman and Jewish culture shared some things in common uh, in the first century and that the household formed the crucial part of societal structure. We might say today in our culture that it may not be the family in some circumstances which provides the, net, the, the essential structure to society. Maybe it does, maybe it should, it doesn't always. But in that culture it was the household. And the household was often of course a lot more than mum, dad and two kids. Yeah. Some of us come from cultures where two children would be seen as just getting started, <laughs> mm. right? And in many parts of the world, it's still the case. You're expecting six, seven, eight, nine kids or more. I don't know. Some of us might come from families like that. I, I don't know. My grandparents came from families where they were one of seven, eight, or nine children. That was normal, right? Um, and again, in this culture, that you know, lots of children, um, perhaps a number of slaves, Servants living perhaps in the house, you've got lots of you've got generational grandparents, parents, children, and so on. In a household, it's a big deal. Extended families uh, were the, the norm within a household. 
These days one tends to be living very separately, at least in our culture. Uh, conversion to Christianity often involved whole households following the lead of the household head into the faith. Can you think of a, some from the New Testament? Cornelius. Cornelius. Mm -hmm. Cornelius the jailer. Jailer. The jailer in Acts 16. Lydia. Sorry, what did you say? The guard. Yeah. The guard. Okay, the, uh, Acts 16, the, the prison. Um, Lydia. The prison. The jailer. The jailer. Sorry, the word I'm looking for. Yes. <laughs> Lydia in Acts 16. Okay, you've got several. Acts 16, you've both got Lydia and the jailer in Acts 18. You've got Crispus. They and their whole household followed them into the faith. And yeah. Actually, again, in some cultures we see more of this perhaps than in our own. Mm -hmm. In India, for example, mm -hmm. uh, often you'll see one member become a Christian and then the rest mm -hmm. follow. So it's quite common that you saw whole households uh, becoming Christians. And perhaps this helps to explain the recognition of elders early on in the life of congregations in the New Testament as being a faster process than perhaps in our culture. Not to say God couldn't do it as quickly in our culture, the Holy Spirit can do anything, but you could say that their culture was set up more naturally for elders to more naturally, swiftly to arise than our own. And maybe what that does is it makes us, gives us pause to think about what is the way that we can help to um, to try and create conditions within the way that we do church so that elders can more swiftly arise than they otherwise might do, given that our, our household structures are different to the New Testament. So that's something for us to think about. I'm not going to talk about that in detail right now. Houses in the um, houses and households in the first century, some were as small as I'm sure some of the places we live, which are pretty small, right? But often they were much bigger in, in floor area, and so you had often places which would hold 20, 30, 40 people for a church service in your own home. You'd have a courtyard. Um, many moderately well-to-do households could have 30 people at church quite comfortably. Probably most of our homes, you're not going to get 30 people in comfortably. <laughs> you might squeeze them in, but they're not going to be comfortable, right? You could have a 10-minute church service, one song, one prayer, quick take communion, you're all standing up, and then we have to go, you know. But in, the, in those days, you could get 30 people in, you might get 40, 45 people in uh, quite comfortably at a squeeze for a while. A bit of a different situation again, so ours. So the idea is if you're the head of the household and you have a church of 30 people, it's very natural that, that person become an elder of that congregation. They're, they're connected to those relatively small number of people very closely. It was the, those conditions, I think, held elderships raise up relatively uh, quickly. Church was not done at church, in a sense. Church was done at home, because church was in your home. We don't go to, now we go to church. But it, in fact, you understand what I'm saying there. It's a very different setup. A place like Corinth, as an example, is also perhaps a little bit different. Corinth was a bit of a strange city, even in the first century. And, uh, but that had a situation in the, in the, um, in society where they had areas of the city controlled by what they called patrons. So I don't know, a bit like a local councillor, maybe, but on a smaller scale. <clears throat> and those patrons would not only be the he head of their own household, but the head of a sort of a grouping of households within a certain area. And perhaps that helps to explain why in some, uh, why, why perhaps also some people came to oversee a number of house churches. <clears throat> we see perhaps those patron types and now not only overseeing their own household, but a number of households. That might explain some people who became elders overlooking a number of house group churches, if you like. That could be part of that. Um, so that's a bit of the culture. I mean, there's a lot we could talk about there, but I hope that's helpful. A little bit of background. Let's talk about two words that are used in the New Testament about elders. One, presbyteros, and the other, episcope. Um, the presbyteros word is in Titus 1.5 and then 1 Timothy 3 for uh, episcopate. A translated usually elder, one of them, and overseer, the other. I think uh, both the same kind of person, but describing different uh, parts of their function and identity. Um, elder or presbyteros being more a description of age. They are older, they are elder than most. That's the age thing. 
and their status in community. They are seen in that light as being someone who's uh, perhaps got that maturity and wisdom in life. The episcopate word, the overseer word, perhaps is more a description of their function. They are actually overseeing or managing or leading. That's the, what they're doing as opposed to who they are. They are older, but they are doing something. They're an elder and they're overseeing. That's what's going on there. The word episcopate can also mean guardian or supervisor, <laughs> inspector, someone who watches over something or someone. Sorry, Mark, are they, yes. are they Greek words? They yes, they are. Right. Yes, correct. They are. Presbyteros, Greek word meaning elder, episcopi meaning overseer. Uh, one thing to add to these two words is that whenever we see them in the New Testament used describing people, they are in the plural. They're always in the plural. Which seems to indicate that the churches in the New Testament had more than one elder, more than one presbyteros, more than one episcopi, more than one overseer, more than one elder within that church. So it seems that we have a plurality of elders in the churches. Uh, 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 we do not, I don't know that we can say that that is a theologically uh, watertight box that we have to insist upon. I think, because the Bible doesn't say that, it doesn't say you can only have a plurality. But there must be some significance to the reason why there is a plurality. So I think that's something to take into consideration when we're thinking about appointing or recognizing um, an elder or an eldership uh, in the future here in Birmingham or wherever we happen to go. So that's something else to be thinking about. Now, what else? Um, here's what I'd like to do for a moment. Can we just take two minutes um, where I'm going to stop speaking and I'm going to ask you with the person sitting next to you to open up. Perhaps one of you opens up 1 Timothy 3 and the other one Titus 1. These are the two, two big New Testament passages on eldership. I'd like you just to discuss, have a quick scan down the, the passages, just, just read down, I'm sure you know them, just have a quick scan down them, and ask yourself, what is the same between those two passages, and what is different? What do you notice, and particularly I'm, I'm interested in the differences, but look for what's the same. So can we take two minutes to do that here? Look at 1 Timothy 3, look at Titus 1, and look at the things it says about elders, and look at what's the same, and look at what's different. And then we'll come back and and discuss this in two minutes. Just two minutes, just a quick thing. Titus 1. The passage from 
from those five. From yes, yes, sorry. Yes. How are we doing, everybody? Finding some things? Okay, tell you what, let's stop for a second. And I know we could spend quite a while on this, but I just want to get a few things out here. And then please feel free to take this idea away and do a bit more detailed study on it. So what Yeah, what did you notice? What did you see that's similar or different? Well, Either not, way. No, not quite the same. You know, an overseer yeah, responsible. You know, basic things like that. And both of them parallel each other. Okay, you've got to have both. Seems to be an important quality. You have to mention both. Okay, what else? He's got to be married with children. Okay, <laughs> that's okay. Right, okay, we see that common thing, all right? one of those things where you don't, could you be married with not children? Oh, well, we'll come back to, we'll come on to some of that in a bit. Good question, but we will come on to that. All right, what else? What do we see that's like mentioned in one but not in the other, for example? Have you seen anything like that? Yeah. Uh, talking about the specific scriptures in, um, mm -hmm. in Titus, it talks about uh, the, the, the redeeming qualities, but in, um, in Titus, sorry, in 1 Timothy 3, it's more of a command. Mm. More of a command. Mm. It's to be above and must manage. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Mm. <laughs> Okay, thanks. I'll think about that then. Good. All right, what else? Recent, yeah. recent convert. Must be a recent convert. Yeah. That's in one but not the one, other. Not the other. Okay, the anything? Money. Sorry? Not a lover of money. Not a lover of money. It's in both. It's in both. I think that's in both, isn't it? I think that's in both. Yeah. Not being overbearing. Not being overbearing. Is that in? It's in Titus but not in? Not in them. In 1 Timothy 3? Anything else? Be a student of how he approaches doctrine and teaching. Congregation. Teaching? That's in Titus, right? Yeah. Is it? In both. Is that, that one's in both. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. All right. Do they all mention the same things? There are quite a lot. Yeah. The word overseas only mentioned in Titus. Is it in Titus? Is it Mentioned in Titus. You're saying it's not mentioned in. Overseer is in Timothy. And it's in yeah, verse seven of Titus. Yeah, but the word elder isn't ah. in uh, First Timothy, is it? First Timothy. Besides the overseer. Da, da, da. Well, there you go. It uses the word overseer in 1 Timothy 3, but not the word elder, but it uses the word elder in Titus. There's a difference. Okay. Whether that's significant or not, that's a, you know, a discussion, which we're not going to have right now on, on that level of detail. But I think it's quite interesting to me. The reason for this exercise, and, and you'll see more, I think, if you take a bit more time over it. You'll see there are several things that are, are 
repeated or implied as in, in repeated. But I think there are some things that are different. And I'll tell you why I think this is important, which is that it's very significant to a, uh, significant and important, I think, to approach 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1 not as a checklist. That someone can be recognized as an elder as long as we can tick it all of these boxes. I'll explain more why as we go through. But I think it's important not to see it as a checklist because I'm not sure that Titus and Timothy had each other's lists for all we know. I mean, why, why doesn't Paul write the same exact list to both? That's kind of interesting. It seems to me it's more about the character than it is about the detail in some respects. Not every respect, I'll come on to that. It's not about ticking boxes. Not everything that is included, uh, sorry, that could be included, is included. He hasn't written here about uh, people who have been involved in pedophilia or serious crime, fraud, where they spent time in jail and saying they can or cannot be, I mean, it's, you know, to try and think of all the possible things that could have been in, included. Think about your own sins from before you were a Christian, your sin list. I mean, you know, there's a, it's a, and if we added up all of our sins, some of us didn't commit all of each other's sins, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it would be a very long list. And you, that's not the point. The point is about the heart and the character as much as anything. I think what Paul is instilling in the mind and the heart of Titus and Timothy is to look at the qualities of these men, not, not as not qualifications. Yeah. In my mind, in a way, you don't really qualify to become an elder by, you know, passing A-level <laughs> holiness. You know, it, it's, <laughs> it's not, you don't, you know, when I got into university here in Birmingham, I had to get three Bs. And when Penny had to get in to do medicine, she had to get rather higher qualifications than that, involving A's. <laughs> and, and science, science, science topics, and anyway, but there are different, there are different levels of qualification for different. Qual it's not that's not the point here. It's 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 not that. It's about it's about the character, I believe, and perhaps the reason why these lists are different is because Paul knew that to be an elder in this church, you really need these qualities, because this church needs men who are like this. And in this church, you need men who are more like this. I mean, they need to have some of the things the same, but they also need this because of the culture, the, the, the history of the church, the local society. Uh, who knows? If we take Crete as an example, there you got Crete on the map, perhaps a very different place uh, where Titus is to where Timothy is. The Cretan context um, uh, could be this, that in, in Titus it mentions dishonest gain, that they must not be pursuing dishonest gain. Why? Because later on down in the passage you've got the circumcision group are troubling the church there and he says they must be silenced because they're disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. Mm -hmm. And so for an elder to be credible in that church and to be useful to that church and the members of that church, they must be someone who is completely above reproach in the specific area of dishonest gain. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I would say perhaps elder, this is why it's important, I think perhaps you could say perhaps future elders in Birmingham might not have all the exact same qualities as an elder in London or Manchester, or Siberia, or who knows where. Some things will be surely the same. We'll come on to that. But I think it's important because we're not then comparing apples with pears yeah. as we think about the future. Okay. You could make the uh, a similar observation about First Timothy 3 is that um, there's this emphasis the children obeying him with proper respect. And the problem they would have in Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 is that even some of the elders would become false leaders and false teachers. But you know, it's one thing, I think your family exposes you more than anything else that you do. And a false 
leader, you know, that would be an important quality. So how did it go in the leadership of this family? Because children don't seem to put up with hypocrisy very well <laughs> and uh, help, us, help us see our, you know, our weakness in that area. So it's just a, it's an interesting thought, yeah. That's, that's a good point. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's move on. By the way, this first session, I'm top loading it. All right, so the first session, you're getting the most information. The second session, slightly less. And the third one, even less. Okay, so but I'm giving you most information in this first session, all right? So that's why you've got a pen and a piece of paper, I hope. Okay, a couple more things. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the qualities in more detail and just a bit more detail. We can't do everything today, but a bit more detail. Uh, some of the qualities that are mentioned in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus chapter 1, blamelessness, irreproachability. I would put these two together. Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3, not uh, being above reproach or beyond reproach, being blameless. Why is that important? Um, someone who's blameless um, is somebody who is not sinless. That's not possible. Uh, but they are a person whose external reputation is likely to bring credit to the church. Bringing credit to the church rather than the opposite is very important. He must be blameless and above reproach. A good reputation with outsiders, 1 Timothy 1, uh, 3, verse 7. Bringing credit to the church. The private and the public must match. Uh, Archie Kendall spoke to me years ago, um, someone I love and respect very much, who talked about the fact that he said, I want to be more in private than I am in public. I want to be more a Christian in a sense when no one's looking than I even am when people are around me. And that's the right spirit, I think. Blamelessness can't mean sinlessness. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8, Paul tells the church to be blameless. We're all supposed to be blameless. This is not just something for an elder, but there's a different quality perhaps to it here. Reproach, uh, blameless, uh, irreproachable. The word implying that the man not only is reported of well, but he deserves that report. Sometimes speak, people speak better of us than we deserve. Uh, sometimes they speak worse of us. Than we deserve. But this is someone who deserves the good report made about them. Uh, of course, it's God who does that, but you understand what I'm saying, I think. Um, so, the public and the private are the same. Plutarch uses one of these words, and I have actually forgotten which to look it up. But Plutarch uses one of these words to describe the character of someone who teaches children. This makes a good teacher. Someone who is irreproachable or blameless. In other words, um, you would be a person like this is someone that you would be completely comfortable leaving your children in the care of. You'd be happy for them to babysit. You'd be happy for them to teach kingdom kids. You'd be happy for them to take your son or your daughter on a trip to a museum. You'd have no qualms whatsoever. I think that's the kind of feeling that someone who is irreproachable and blameless brings to a church and to the people around them. I think the rest of the words we're going to look at very much uh, really uh, draw out the meaning of these words um, here. Right, let's talk about marriage and family. Um, the elder is a one-woman man. I think might be the clearest, most literal translation of the Greek. And uh, others could correct me if I'm wrong there, but from what I have it's read. That's correct. All right. A one-woman man. Uh, the words for woman and wife are the same, so but we would assume that it is his wife if it's a woman. Um, so it's a one-wife, one-woman man. Uh, Titus 1, 6, uh, I think is the phrase there. An elder must be blameless, faithful to his wife, a, a one-woman man. Um, why is this important, as we should ask? Surely it's because through all of Scripture, God demonstrates that covenant is really important to Him. And there is a covenant between God and His people, but the relationship between a husband and wife is a covenant also. And God takes covenant seriously. He takes faithfulness to the covenant seriously. That's why He sent His prophets one description I heard of a prophet is a prophet is a covenant enforcer. <laughs> I rather like that. 
They're not a fourth teller, future teller. Primarily they are a covenant enforcer. And the prophet goes to God's people and says, God's people, they say, yes, you made a promise to do this. And God promised this in return. God's keeping his promises. You are not. Move back over here with God. And let's, let's have the covenant where it should be. They're a covenant and enforcer. And so uh, it's very important. Um, could an elder be someone who had been previously divorced? I don't think the Bible gives us a definitive answer to that because it doesn't say specifically whether someone is allowed to have been divorced or not. I would suggest that in most of our churches this isn't usually the case. Most elders have not been divorced previously. I'm not sure I'm familiar with an example of one who has, but I'm not sure that we could set it as a rule since before what happens before someone's a Christian, for example, is something that is not irrelevant to one's life, but it is forgiven. And we do begin again when we get effectively a, a covenant with God in baptism. So there's a discussion you might want to have about that. Yeah, Bob and Pat Gimple. Oh, that's a good example. Well-known well elders, Maybe. but uh, she, was remar she was married to Doug Arthur's father. father. Yes. And, and divorced and married. There you go. There's an example. I forgot. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We do have examples. So it's a one-woman man, at least as he stands. There's just the one. I've not got others secretly stashed away somewhere <laughs> elsewhere. Okay. Um, I think what's being emphasized here is faithfulness. Yeah. It's faithfulness, isn't it? Yeah. It's can this man be trusted to be faithful is really uh, the question. Children, the children having faith, Titus 1 verse 6, who's a man whose children believe. A man whose children believe. What does it mean? Well... I think in the context of the culture, it seems to be most likely that we're talking about children who are Christians and who are living at home. He's managing his household. His household presumably includes his children. So it, it makes most sense to me, at least, that these would be children who are Christians and children who are still at home. That doesn't mean some of them couldn't have left home, but in this context of what we're talking about, about overseeing a household, that seems to be the most natural sense to what is being said here. Um, the key idea is probably not that they are at home, but that they are Christians, but it's most likely in that context they may well still have been at home. What happens if they leave home and leave the Lord? Can this person still serve as an elder? And I might have some notes on that a little bit later, but I'll just say this for now. I would think if I were an elder and my children struggle with their faith to the point of leaving the faith, I think I would want to offer to the church that I not serve as an elder. Whether the church wish me to serve as an elder at that point or not, I think that's up to the church. But I think the right heart would be to offer to say, I don't know, how do you feel about that? Does it disqualify someone from being an elder if their kids are 25, 30, 40 years old and leave the Lord? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure the Bible gives us clarity on that. But I think the heart would be, I think it's up to the church. What do you think? That would be my take on that for, for this, at this point. Not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Let, we need to talk about that a little bit because that can be interpreted lots of different ways. Um, wild and disobedient. The word wild there means reckless living or debauchery. Uh, disobedient meaning unruly, insubordinate, refractory. Now, that refractory, there's not a word we don't use often enough. Disorderly, comptu, this is a good word, comptumacious. <laughs> comptumacious. I think we're talking about Charles Dickens at this point. <laughs> or lawless. So we're not talking about kids who are a bit naughty. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're not talking about kids who are occasionally, you know, disobedient and don't do their homework and don't tidy their room when they're told to or, you know, sometimes lie or, we're not talking about normal naughtiness here. We're talking about people who are, kids who are just, they're, they are off the rails and not only have gone off but I think stayed off. <laughs> In fact, lost sight of the rails <laughs> over the horizon at this point, right? So 
we need to understand this because otherwise the potential elders kids can get under be under such scrutiny they're going to be goody two shoes and you know can't misbehave once and it creates tremendous tension for that family it's not fair on the kids or the all the parents and it doesn't help the church so let's be reasonable that um, wild and disobedient is quite out there um, I, I think is what he's talking about here a bit more about marriage and family First Timothy 3, he must manage his own family well. First Timothy 3, 4. Uh, okay, I've got you two translations there. One, the NIV uh, 1984 version. And one, the NIV 2011 version. And they're significantly different. And I, this is something, that, I don't know how I came across this, but I thought this was very interesting. The, the emphasis of the 84 version he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. The stress is on the children's behavior. They must obey him. 2011 version, he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. The emphasis is on the father. In that, it's the way he does it. It's more important than the outcome. And the outcome still matters but it's the it's the way it's the manner and I think why is it I think the 2011 I'm not enough of a Greek expert to know if that's a better translation it's just that it's a it's a clause in the Greek and it either modifies the man or it modifies his children so it you have to make a choice when you translate it and it wouldn't have gen it wouldn't have a number so it won't show the it's just a clause I mean so it, either one is... Either one is a legitimate that's translation. Right. That's right. I like the second one better. <laughs> that doesn't make it right. There could be another one as well. But NLT version. And then, well, there are, there are many, trans, I mean, yeah. many versions, of course. But I, I just wanted to point this out because I think it is important that sometimes we, we might get a particular understanding of an emphasis based on one translation. Mm -hmm. And it may be important to read all these verses yeah. in several different translations mm -hmm. to get a better picture of what it might be saying to us. I do like the 2011 version, if only for the fact that I think it might help us as those of us who could end up being elders to understand and remember that it's not about a fear-induced obedience. It's not about controlling our children into a certain kind of behavior. That's not the point. It's about helping our children to have real faith of their own, not to conform to our way of telling them how they must live. And surely we're more likely to have children that make it in the faith for the long term if we teach them real faith and don't try and force them into things than, than if we do the opposite. So I, I just think that's important as we think about uh, these uh, things uh, uh, about eldership and some of the translations. Um, family management and church management uh, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, and all that, talk about this. If anyone doesn't know how to manage his family, how can he take care of God's church? Um, management is very important. Um, I think it's telling us that an elder is someone who has successfully built a healthy family dynamic. They manage their, health, their, their family <coughs> healthily. Their wife is not someone who is super timid and... And, and fearful and you know and tense because of their, what their husband might say or do. They might be tense and nervous because of stuff in their upbringing, but I'm talking about the husband, okay? Who knows? I talk, that, the husband is not someone that induces that sense of fear around them. There is a healthy dynamic. I think it would imply at least that the uh, household finances, as far as it depends upon the, the, the head of the household, um, are in good shape. Um, it's not, I'm not saying that if you've got debts you can't be an elder, but someone who has a history of financial mismanagement through folly or um, impetuous behavior is probably not managing their household well. It doesn't mean they're a bad person, it's just we're talking about someone who's going to have a significant influence on managing God's church, and so they need to be good at this stuff. Um, it's a management role in some ways, to stand before, to lead. And so that is why I think there's a tie-up between family management and church management here. Okay, a couple more and then we'll take some questions and or a break depending on what you want. 
Now, I'm not going to go through all of these other qualities from 1 Timothy 3 or Titus 1 in all the detail we could because it's a, a time that be, we'd get overwhelmed. But I would like to mention a few things about some specifics about the character and ministry uh, qualities of an elder as described in uh, 1 Timothy and Titus. Firstly, overbearing, not overbearing, meaning self-willed, stubborn, or arrogant. That's 1 Timothy 1.7. Stubborn or arrogant. I think an elder needs to be strong, and there is a good kind of stubbornness. Stubbornness against sin, or stubbornness against false doctrine. Or stubborn, I mean, that, that's fine. But not someone who's just like, won't listen. A stubborn person in this context is someone who just won't listen. They, you, you say two words, and they say a hundred. That, that's not, that's overbearing. Um, fu the, uh, the function of 1 Timothy 3.1, the reason why uh, function is there is that it says most importantly whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task it does not say whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble title mm. or a noble position mm -hmm. a noble task the function is more important than any recognition or any role mm -hmm. I think what that tells us is that if someone is put up as a candidate to be an elder, let's say a church, whatever process is chosen, says, here is a possible elder or a group of elders, what do you think? It ought to be so obvious to the church that these people would be reasonable to consider that everybody would go, well, yeah, you know, if you'd asked any of us, we'd have said the same people, more or less. And we'd say, well, of course they can serve as an elder because they're already eldering. It's someone who's already doing it, really, who is then recognized, or perhaps given greater responsibility, but nonetheless, it's already happening. They desire the function, not the title. That's key to being, I think, an elder. Uh, not quick-tempered, meaning not inclined to anger, not, uh, another word, uh, used flaring in anger. I think an elder should, at times, be angry. Jesus was angry. He had indignation against sin and against hypocrisy and against all kinds of things, right? It's okay to have anger. There's a righteous anger. God has righteous anger. But we're talking here about a flaring anger. That's the kind of thing where it burns so much that it burns the people around you. Mm. People around you get singed. You know, and that's n not a good way, right? We're, we're not supposed to be having spiritual barbecue uh, <laughs> around the place. We're, so, no singeing. Um, not given to drunkenness. Um, meaning being drunk, losing self-control. This doesn't have to be a teetotaler. It needs to be someone who does not lose control in their use of any alcohol they do drink. Uh, not a violent man, not violent, meaning uh, another synonym for the Greek word is bullying. Not being a bully. I think we recognize that when we see it, at least generally. Not pursuing dishonest gain, we talked about earlier. Um, not being shamefully greedy. I like that other way of phrasing that. Shamefully greedy. Um, hospitable. Two words. Philo and xenos meaning a lover of strangers. They are a lover of strangers. Most commonly in the New Testament, this word is used of Christians being hospitable to other Christians. I, I think that's the most common context. I'm sure it must extend beyond that. But what I think what this is telling us is this is a person who enjoys having people in their home, in their life. They don't push people away. We all need some space from time to time. I'm not talking about someone who lets their house become New Street Station <laughs> to the point where they have no time or space for themselves, their wife or their children. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about people who say, come over. You're hurting. You're bereaved. You're struggling. You've got this going on in your life. Come over to my house. Come and eat my food. Let's sit down, let's pray, let's talk, or let's just be together. But they love, they love other people. They love being around other people. They get something powerful is going on there with them. Um, love the, a loving what is good, a lover of the good, or a fosterer of virtue. Virtue is a much, uh, uh, um, it's a word, it's a concept we, we strayed away from. Um, in our society, but <coughs> loves what is good. Self-controlled, 
Um, of sound mind, sane, temperate, discreet, or wise. And it comes down to the idea of, of knowing yourself and, and knowing when to close one's mouth and not say what one is thinking or express what one is feeling at that time, taking time to go away and pray. Mm. Uh, part two of this, some of the other qualities, being temperate, uh, sober, not given over to emotions, uh, not someone without emotions, but not given over to them, not controlled by them, of a sound mind, sane, temperate, or discreet, uh, someone who is upright, who is just, equitable, and fair. It's hard being fair, especially when you are being hurt. And an elder is someone who is going to have false <coughs> accusations made against them from time to time. They have to be strong enough to be able to take that and look out for the interest and the just treatment of others even more than their just treatment of themselves. I only need to cite you the example of Jesus Christ uh, for that. Someone who's holy... Uh, a devout person, I think that's all that's talking about. They, they're devout. They love God. They love what God loves. It's not much more complicated than that, perhaps. Disciplined. Uh, that's uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, strong, stout. That's a good word. Stout, not in the volume sense. <laughs> but, you know, a stout of spirit. That's right, a stout heart. You know the, yeah, you know what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. A stout person, possessed of mastery. They've mastered themselves. Um, empowered, so they're disciplined. Um, they must holdly, they must hold firmly to the faithful message. That's Titus one nine. Um, they hold firmly to it. They refute false doctrine. That's a fighter. I think there's a fighting kind of aspect to that. That's someone who says, "This is wrong. We're going to put this right. This is being taught wrong. We're going to teach this right." And they get in there and they work with people and they fight uh, for the truth. It's the kind of stamina of we're going to fight till we die. Uh, that's it. I'm just going to, this is what I stand on. Um, a good reputation with outsiders. First Timothy 3, 7. That's the test of the world. It's a testimony. The word is marturia, which is the same word used for a martyr or a witness. So it's a witness. We witness the gospel where we live in our neighborhood, where we work. We are a witness by just the way we live. It's that thing of if we have to tell someone we're a Christian, We've not been doing it right. If someone knows you, you shouldn't need to tell them that you're a Christian, right? That, you know, I, you know, we've proved may have had this, and I forget who it was. Someone said to me recently, I was working seven years with somebody, and, uh, and they didn't know I was a Christian. And we, who was it, Augustine or someone else who said, no, it wasn't Augustine. It was one of the, someone who said, preach the word wherever you go, where necessary, if necessary, use words. Mm. It. We preach by the way we live, right? So, that, mm -hmm. so it, it should be that someone finds out you're a Christian, who you work with or you live nearby, and they're like, oh, that explains it. <coughs> that's, I get, I get it now. Yeah, okay. And I think that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Of course, that applies to all Christians, mm -hmm. but surely for an elder it should be kind of, they, they exemplify this in the way that they live. Uh, reputation, they're an able teacher, they're apt or qualified to teach, they're dacticon. Uh, perhaps able to preach as well as teach. I don't know. The distinction is not made here. Perhaps some elders are not particularly gifted at preaching, but certainly can teach. Others might be able to do both. And we'll come on to that a bit later. But certainly they are good at teaching with the Bible. People you can have confidence in. Um, to, uh, this is the a word meaning to persuade, to believe, to believe in, to trust in. These are trust people that you feel, the church as a whole would feel, we trust this man and the way that he lives and the way that he leads. And then in 1 Peter 5, leading by example. We'll come on to the scripture later, so we won't spend time on it now in another context. But uh, leading by being an example. Uh, if we don't have enough time to lead by example, we uh, aren't in a place to be able to lead others. Um, so... I, those are the qualities we've been through briefly. Now, another question for you. Um, do you want to take some questions now or do you want to break? And then we can uh, do questions later. You can tell me in the break. Do you want to pop to the um, kettle, get a drink and get refreshed? What do you want to do? Andy, what do you I, th want? I think we've got an hour and ten minutes left. So mm -hmm. we should probably take a little break now and then right. go for the rest.
Just time. All right. Let's take a short break. If you've got questions, come and speak to me and I'll see if I can put them in the next bit and we'll go on from there. Thanks, Alfred. Okay.